Hi, I'm Stephanie Skinner from Culture Media, and we are here to talk once again about cheese, and this time with the one and only Michelle Buster. And if you know anything about Michelle, uh, you know you're about to get a postgraduate course in cheese. Um, her passion shines through in everything that she does and everything she says. So this is going to be a super fun one. Hopefully you've all got your cheeses in front of you and the pairings that she's, that she's uh, particularly uh, selected for the cheeses. And she is going to talk about each and every one of those cheeses. And she has asked for each of us to taste them as we go along. So a couple of uh, housekeeping notes. Um, we, there, we absolutely love to hear from you. We love to hear your, your comments. Please use the Q&A button that should be either at the top or on the right of your screen. That way we can look at them and I can read them during the, during the presentation. I will not be on screen, but I will be reading those questions to Michelle as we go along. And she also has said that if she doesn't get to some of your questions today, uh, she will answer them at, offline at a different time. So. Uh, I think that's all for now. I think we're going to have Michelle take it away. So please go. Hi, everyone. You have no idea how excited I am to be here today. Um, I miss our industry. I miss you all. I miss talking cheese. I miss the camaraderie. So I guess this is next best. And I'm always excited to talk cheese to you. And of course, I have to have a sheep involved. So He's around for, you know, believe it or not, I was saying I still get nervous when I do this. So, you know, he helps calm me down. Uh, today, we're actually going to visit some cheeses from Island Cheeses. I um, Things that I currently love, we have some new, we have some things that are not so new, but maybe we want you to know about them and think about them some more. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Michelle Buster. I've been doing this now heh, since 1993. And I've been learning every single day of my life in the cheese world. Um, if we start the PowerPoint, you'll get to see my partner who is very often behind the scenes. Um, I couldn't do it without him. It's really, he taught me cheese. So his family are the Fulby Pecorino Romano, which we will go through and taste today. He has other sheep's milk cheeses, Cache de Broma, Fulby. So these were my beginnings in getting our industry to know his family's cheeses. And then it was me who wanted to go off on a tangent because I had lived for three years in Spain and I couldn't imagine selling cheese without bringing what I consider to be like the best Manchego and explaining that not all, not all Manchego is created equal and bringing that here. Um, can we go forward in the uh, PowerPoint please? So there's Pierluigi off to the left. We're there visiting one of our Parmigiano farms. Um, thank you, Pierluigi, for going on 30 years of my knowing you. It's a really long milestone. Um, that's me doing a wine tasting here at Macy's. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the countries that we cover today, Italy, Spain, Portugal, and Croatia. And each one has been kind of like a crazy shopping spree for me. If, I, if we have to have something and we have to then figure out how to make you fall in love with it too, that's how we do it. So Italy from Pierluigi's family, Spain starting in Manchego, and then it just became this deep treasure trove for which we've never come out of. Portugal, because it's such a special place and nobody else was paying attention to it. And then, well, as you see this photo of Croatia, once you see a sunset like that, you know, who doesn't want to go back? And I was lucky enough to find one of the best cheeses ever in Pashkisir and the Dalmati nuts. Um, next slide, please. This is some more of our products just to show that we, you know, for us, it's not enough to just find a great product. It's about the relationship that we have with our producers. So it's not just uh, buying and selling every single product in our line. We work directly with the people who make the products. We can help influence them. We work together. We've worked together through this pandemic. Um, we had a lot of people asking how people were doing at this time. And we tried to come out with some videos with some people who were willing to share what was going on. Other people were way too distressed to actually participate. But we truly believe that our relationship is unique in the industry 
um, with all of our different producers over there. Um, and I feel very, very fortunate to have such a great cheese family on both sides of it. Okay, we're gonna start today. Next slide. Ah, before I do that, no, go back, go back. Just to explain here that this is Paola Calcellata. She makes our mostarda. So the pink grapefruit mostarda that came to you, we'll be tasting that today. And Paola is a former um, pharmacist who turned uh, mostarda maker. Cesare Casella, one of our producers of uh, the different prosciutti, the Cesare Casella prosciutti. These are the Almond Sisters, the two girl, cute girls here who do most of our nuts and wonderful chocolate nuts and different things like that. And we have Quattro Portoni down here and we have Enrico and Maria Rosso who do Castro Rosso, Margo and some other wonderful cheeses. But again, it's all about these relationships um, that's so special. Okay, next, thanks. This is just some of our people in our warehouse. We have two quality control managers. People are checking. She's constantly seeing how it is. We're looking all the time. I'm there all the time. We want to know how things taste, smooth, look. We look at what kinds of molds are there, the cheese which is developing which way. Pierluigi and his provolone ever here is our uh, QC manager. Uh, Enrico at the top here has been working with us for over 22 years. Um, you know, we're very proud of the people who are so invested in our company as well. Um, and I think we can start, I think the next slide is going to start with Alicia. <laughs> Let's go to Fuerteventura. Alicios means, is the name of the trade winds that blows across um, the Canary Islands. This is, it looks like a mini majorero, which is the most well-known cheese from the Canary Islands. This cool pattern on the outside of this cheese was actually formed in, in, um, before plastic molds. They took palm leaves and they wove them together. I adore this cheese. I think that it has, you know, the flavor profile is straightforward. It's interesting. You've got great brightness. You get some grassiness. You have good acidity. The um, paprika on the rind just helps and it enhances it and marries the flavor. It's nothing about it that's overpowering. Um, and Stevan, who I think we should see next. Let's see if it's a Stevan. Okay, we get to see where these are. So this is Forte, Forteventura over here. You have all these different islands. There's milk and cheese making on just about all of the islands. Gran Canaria is known for its cow's milk. Um, Fuerteventura Lanzarote is known for its goat's milk. There's, I. Um, cheese made in almost every one that's there. But uh, for goat's milk and for this cheese, we have the cow's milk from Alicios comes from Gran Canaria and the goat's milk comes from Fuerteventura. And the company Grupo Garadero Fuerteventura, they are responsible for 80% of the, for selling and buying and selling and using 80% of the production of milk in this area. So they're very important to the economy of this place. These are volcanic islands. It's a really cool place to be. And when we get to see the goats, the goats live outside all the time. They only come inside to be, to be milked. Um, let's see a little bit more about this island. It's beautiful. You have to the north, you have these beautiful seas and here you have the volcanic rock. In the center, it's all super desert-like and the goats were hanging out in the desert as well. Um, it's just a very changing and, and a very interesting place. So then you have these strong crosswinds that blow on it. And that's also why the island is called Fuerteventura. It means strong winds. Next slide, thanks. Here we have some goats. Majorero goat, if they stand, well, even if they don't stand up, they come up to my chest. And then when they stand up, they are taller than me. So there was um, hundreds and hundreds hanging outside, going around, and then they come inside, they get um, milked once a day, and then they go back out. Uh, this breed has a uh, very uh, high um, protein and uh, very good butter fat in the milk. So you can taste that, I find, in all of the cheeses, you get this really nice flavor of the butter. For me, what I love personally is I want all the cheeses that we have that you can taste that milkiness that it doesn't just taste like salt or texture, but that you really get the flavor of the milk in it to know that it's fresh and it's good. And they're using same day or one day in the next milk to make their cheeses. 
Um, this is one producer that I didn't know for many years when we used to just pre-order some Majorero. But I met him at the New York Fancy Food Show one year and they, I invited he and his girlfriend over to my house for drinks and our relationship changed. And from there, we started looking at this whole relationship differently that we wanted to do things together and it really changed it. So Alicio's is a project, he had a different name to the cheese and we wanted something that was more indigenous to what it was. So, you know, Esteban was like, I wanna support you in whatever you're doing. So we created Alicio's Smoking Goat and Gofio is like our trilogy of goats. And having that support and their vision has really changed our partnership to move forward. And it's very exciting. Let's go to the next slide, please. Here's Esteban and his girlfriend Laura. And it was a surprise when they, when Laura was pregnant, she told me when she was in New York and then um, all of a sudden they ended up with twins. And um, great family. This is one of the videos that they did for us when um, right in the middle of the pandemic, we wanted to know how they were doing. So we'll just, he'll say hi for a sec. Uh, Okay, just wanted you to get to hear it. It's, it's different when you get to hear people's voices. So here we have, we're in the cheese plant. And this is one of the vats we used to make cheese. This is the master cheese maker um, that I got to meet when, thank God, I went there about a year and a half ago. And this is the Alicia's cheese that they have. They don't, as I said, in the background, there's another label because Alicia's is only our name for the cheese, but they really like it. So we're talking about if they want to switch the name of their cheese to call it Alicia's as well. Miss you guys. I want to go back. Um, next slide, thanks. Um, before we say try it paired with, I'll tell you something really funny about um, Esteban. When I met him and we were talking, he told me this crazy story. He said, I studied for 10 years in Murcia to get my degree. And I came back home finally. And as I got off the plane, my father met me and he said, son, I'm so glad you're here. I'm tired of this cheese business. So you have 72 hours to learn it and then it's yours. And that was 13 years ago, but in three days he had to learn everything. And now he does, like I said, he's responsible for 84% of the milk production. He has to handle the animals. He has to handle, they have two plants. He has to handle transportation, a family, everything. And it's been a pretty fun ride, but crazy. And I got to meet dad and I was like, so this is the man who said, here you go, son. I washed my hands, it's all yours. Um, so to go with Alicia, so what are we going to pair? We're going to pair one of our very favorite items, which is um, our fig cakes. So for those of you who know, we have a lot of different style of fig cakes. Um, we can go to the next slide, thanks. We have fig almond, we have fig mix nuts, we have fig chocolate. We have um, also by the same people like date coconut, date walnut, uh, date walnut cranberry. Um, we're highlighting this time to show you the wedge, the besides doing 11 pound wheels or our new packaging of this eight ounce um, round um, with, I hope you like our new look. And this is actually woven grass in, in the paper. We have a pre-packed wedge, 150 grams. We also have bites, which are 28 grams and they come in like a little display unit. So we're trying to uh, respond to the changes in and labor and other things so that you have other options. If you don't have the labor to cut or if you want something for grab and go in the bites or if you want to do a snack box together and you don't want to cut it small, you can get it already done. So just giving you other options. And this is a line of products that all the, all the labels are new now. We've been slowly by slowly over the past year and a half changing and revolutionizing all of our labeling. And we hope you're as excited as we are because it's been quite a quite a ride um who did the packaging yeah uh, so i was just gonna ask uh, we hired an agency called design room and uh nicole used to design italian shoes and when she said that i knew she was the right person for us and uh great people and we're so excited we hope you love the packaging um so the thing that's so important about this product besides the look is that it's only two ingredients whole pajarero figs that are de-stemmed by hand, 
Marcona almonds. There's a lot of other stuff out there. It's not the same. And I know that we are not the least expensive option out there, but I think we're the freshest option. I think we're the best option. There are some that are like softer and more like kind of mushy. And it's what they do is they put the fig with the stems, with everything, and they kind of smush it all together and then mix it. And it may have a Marcona almond. It might have a, um, a Kamuna almond, but it's, sorry, I think I need to turn that off. But um, it is, um, it is not the same product at all. And this is all hand pressed. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of labor that goes into this, the freshness and everything else. And to me, every time I taste it, it still feels like it's just been made like in the next room. Um, and there's a cost hey, to all of that labor. Hey, Michelle, quick question. Yes. Are the figs used in your, um, in your, your, your fig cake um, different than other figs? Uh, they can be. I can't tell you what everybody else uses or if they declare it, but mm -hmm. we only use the pajarero from Spain. Spanish figs are going to cost more than Turkish figs. Spanish figs have, they're smaller. They have a much thinner skin. So when you bite into them, they're juicier. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know that I've eaten other figs that have kind of wanted to pull my front teeth out. Not everything, but the, a lot of other similar styles don't just blend the fig together, but they put different aromas and spices. Mm -hmm. And to me, if you have such a good raw material, why do you need any other flavors? And this is just subjective, you know, but I'm a very simple, the fewest ingredients uh, as possible. Uh, what's your favorite way to enjoy this big cake pairing? You know, besides cheese, which is great with any cheeses, I shave it in salads. I love it in salads that way. I cube it, I pour chocolate over it. I tell people to use it with ice cream. Um, but I mean, it's just one of those things that's just so simple and refreshing that with any kind of cheese, it's not like it's not gonna go with this, but it'll go with this one in cheese. There's certain other pairings, like some honeys won't go with all cheeses. Um, sometimes like if you have a very aged something like the sugars will clash, but this is just so easy. Um, and my friend's daughter is like hooked on this in a little bit. She's always like, Kira has eaten all the fig cake in the house. We need more. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, um, next slide. These are the brothers who make them and mom and dad. From your left, you have Luis, Jesus, Andres, and uh, sorry, Guillermo. Guillermo is the, the soccer player. Jesus is the youngest. Andres is the guy I talk to all the time. And then Luis is the plant manager. Uh, Mom, dad, and I don't know the name of the dog. I still say I have to learn that, but I will learn it one day. They've all learned from their dad. They started as a very, very tiny company. Today, they're not so, they're not so tiny, but they're the only company I know who is built to be their BRC, their IFS. They built a whole separate facility just to sanitize their figs and clean them and to dry them in a way. Um, that's controlled and spectacular and keeping everything safe because they wanna be able to control from the first raw material to the end process. And that goes for their quince paste and everything else too. And I take my hat off to them. Um, Andres and I don't always see eye to eye as families do, but their dedication to quality and excellence is amazing. And stay tuned because we have a lot more coming from them. We're doing another tasting of, here I'll try and give you a uh, little, I don't know what you can see, little baby jars. They sent me all this stuff now for like doing other chocolate rounds. So we're, we're in the process of more fun things. Bye guys, see you soon. I miss you. I miss going to Europe. I won't lie. Mm -hmm. uh, next slide, please. Okay, second Actually, island. Hey, Michelle, before we move off of the um, Alio, Alio, I can't, now I can't say it. This is Stephanie, Alicios? by the way. Delicious, thank you. How common is rubbing with, um, with paprika on a cheese? Very common in Spain. Although in the Canaries, it's a good question because in the Canaries, um, I don't know when you saw all that earth and, um, and sand and dirt in the center, there's a lot of red 
earth too. But uh, at least uh, Fuerteventura was typical of using like the earth to, pr to protect their cheeses on the outside. Whereas other islands protected their cheeses by smoking. And that's where kind of the smoke and goat comes, but it's actually not typical to Fuerteventura. But you find um, not the same paprika maybe, but Ibores has paprika on the outside. Pimentino has paprika on the outside. For those of you who haven't met Leonora Fuego, we have Leonora cheese with a spicy pimenton de la Vera, which is brand new for us, which is super cool. And you see like the layers of the, the red peeking through from the white mold. So paprika is used very often in Spain because it's so prevalent. Uh, does that, is that a good answer? Any more, like a great... <laughs> Any more questions on Fuerteventura, Licios, anything like that? No? Okay. Let's go to Sardinia. Another place I would not mind going back right now and staring at the, at the beautiful sea. Um, there are so many wonderful places to go in the world. And looking and enjoying Pantaleo, this is for me one of the most amazing, amazing goat cheeses. I mean, it's so difficult to figure out that it's goat. If you were blindfolded or you never saw the label, I don't know how many of you would actually say this is goat cheese. To me, it's so floral. It's so elegant. It's so um, delicate that it's just amazing. And the cheesemaker, his name is Ereño, and they call him El Mago, the magician. And um, they, they call him a magician because whatever cheese he makes is just so delicious. There's just something about it. And he says, yes, my hands have something to do it. He said, but it's where we are, it's the terroir, it's where the animals are grazing because they're very close to the sea and it's the aridness of the area and it's microclimate that contributes so much to give me great raw material so that I can make the cheese this way. And he and I had a fairly long conversation a couple of weeks ago, I was doing another um, webinar and I just wanted to check in with him because it's been a number of years since I saw him. And now he's not employed full time because he's in his 60s after 40 years at the same cheese plant. After like the crucial time, he was 15. He grew up with his parents who, um, they were shepherds. Mom always made cheese at home. And when he's 50, he's like, I guess I'm gonna have to start deciding what I wanna do. And he's like, no, 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 I don't wanna decide yet. So we went off to the army. He kind of did some stuff on his own. And then two years later, he said, okay, I'm ready to decide. I wanna make cheese. And he's never looked back. He said he has been so happy. This is so much his world. Now that he's only working sometimes as a consultant and going there, like he wants to control every little thing. But he said, I know I can't. I have to take care of my mom. So I'll look over them. I'll make sure it's always the same great cheese. But he misses it having his hands every single day. So semi-firm goat's milk cheese from southwest part of uh, Sardinia. We'll show you where it is now. Here we go, down here, southwest. So it's uh, west and south of Cagliari. If you can see, it's not far from the sea at all. We got there in like 15 minutes and then there's also another area. It was kind of this lake area before you got there with a bit of swamp uh, before you got to the sea. And um, that was just, you know, it's very different than as you go around Sardinia, it just changes very much. Cause if you're in the center, it's completely different than this area. This has more of low shrubbery and uh, not so much of just there. So you have, um, it's kind of like underbrush and low and you see there's rockiness here and rockiness over there and then the sea is right there. So the goats like the rocks and we'll go visit the goats now. When I went there, it was a very innovative way. This is the way they were herding the goats. They were using their little uh, scooters and um, it was like in one second, the goats were off and I was like running down this, the road after them to try and keep up. And this is the Capra Sarda, long haired, little bit of everything going out into the brush and over. And here's Andrea. I'd like to run into him again. He looks so young here. And I mean, it's been probably 10 years since I've seen him. There, you, we're talking about Sardinia. Sardinia is sheep country, lots and lots of sheep. But within that, there's a couple of areas where they do make some goat's milk. Um, do raise some goats and make some goat cheeses. And this for me just tops anything I've ever tasted from Sardinia. So 
Thank you, Andrea, for taking care of your goats in this way. And thank you, Il Mago, for making such amazing cheese. Happy, let's go to the next slide, please. Have some of uh, the cheese aging. Uh, this is from our 20th anniversary um, recipe book that we did. And just look at this grain of this cheese. Hopefully you're enjoying it and seeing it very often. Um, I love to chisel the cheese and break it. So we'll see in the Mitica Sardo too, where you're scoring it with a pecorino or a Parmigiano knife, and then just ripping it apart so you can see the textures and work and eat off the textures of the cheese. Um, I'm always trying to think of different ways of merchandising, showing that. So when you talk to your customers for cheese plates, that everything's not just one way. You could do matchsticks and you can do triangles, but show the textures. With a cheese that has that grain, chisel it and do it in a little bit of rocky pieces so that you can have another way of enjoying it and um, eliciting all the aromas of it as well. Um, next one, thanks. Try it paired with, what do you think? What would pair well with this? Da 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 da. I'll give you, it begins with a C, coriander honey. Isn't that weird? Who would ever thought that there is coriander honey? I thought that was the weirdest thing when our producer told us about it. Now, talking about honey, is that a honey or what? Sorry, I hope I'm not being uh, a politically incorrect here, but he is, he's adorable, Fabrizio. Um, I have learned a lot about honey from Fabrizio. He and his brother, Pier Paolo, uh, were well on their way just as a hobby. We'd go out, take the bees, you know, get up in the middle of the night, drive them around because they have to be cloaked and driven to the place where they were going to collect that honey for the time that they were thinking. And then one day he gets a call from me. Um, our producer of Soto Chanade said, you want great honey, you have to meet this man. And we never looked back, either of us. So it's been a wonderful relationship. They're very teeny tiny. Um, you know, there's really just, you know, very little machinery for, they collect the honey wherever it's, they go around in Italy. Um, it goes into the, the panels, the panels go into um, like a centrifuge, it drips out. Um, there's this creamy, this granular nature that just, I think is just so amazing. And this coriander honey just has so many different layers. And to me with the Pantaleo, it's just perfect. You have one floral, you know, delicate cheese with a honey that has just enough flavor, not overpowering that the two together, um, I think are just spectacular. And um, we, uh, Fabrizio also does our honeycomb. And for those of you who have never seen the honeycomb, he arranges these plastic containers inside the panels of the box. And then the bees go inside the box, make the honey inside the plastic boxes. It's the craziest thing. So if you do have the honey, and if you ever never looked at the QR code, scan the QR code and you can hear him talking in Italian, explaining how the bees make this, but it's, it's really, really innovative and love it. The problem is, and, and we can never have enough honeycomb and so Fabrizio set up in the south of Italy to prevent the rain, uh, but it didn't work. And the bees, it still is too rainy. So the bees end up eating. If it rains, the bees eat their own honey. So we are always short of honeycomb, which is kind of crazy. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. This is our new labels. So the coriander honey will go from what you have in your hands to this top left one here. And this is just a sampling of some of the other labels that we've done that are on their way. The, the truffle honey is on its way in the acacia uh, and rhododendron. The coriander honey in this labeling is not quite available yet, but everything's going to change. And we hope you like it. We're very excited for it. And it was really fun doing it. Um, and I thank Chelsea very much because she was my partner in getting all of this um, done to change the labeling. I can't see down below if there are chats and. Okay. You're, no. get, you're getting a lot of, this is Stephanie again. Lots of people are saying that the, um, the labels, labels are beautiful. Thank you. It makes mm -hmm. me feel so good. Mm -hmm. I'm going through withdrawal because we used to have something to look forward to and to do it. And right now we've like finished every single dry good. So um, we have to have, you know, we'll figure out something. 
So the Miti Casardo is also produced by Irenio. And um, it is similar to a Fiori Sardo, but it's not DUP. So we can't call it Fiori Sardo. That's why we call it Miti Casardo. Um, I also love this cheese because it's a really full flavored sheep's milk cheese, but it's not salty. It's just savory and it just keeps going in your mouth. You just feel that sheep's milk, the bowl, but you don't get too much of a piquancy in the back. You don't get over saltiness in it. It's anywhere between six to eight months. We just did repack labels for them too. So they're like mini, mini they look like the label on, on the cheese. And we think that that'll help uh, the product. We're also going to be offering it in pre-cuts and 10 pound random weight boxes uh, since, you know, since the pandemic people wanted more pre-cuts. So we have about nine or 10 different cheeses offered in pre-cut as well, but we'll never stop, you know, wanting, we love to sell the whole wheels. We have the pre-cuts because the market's asking for it, but we still always believe that cheese is best in its whole form, cutting it to order or cutting it a few pieces at a time and not keeping it surrounded in plastic. I'll just say it, what you all probably already know, but cheeses, when you're going to cut them and put them in your case, please let them breathe from their vacuum seal at least an hour in advance. I know you're busy, but cheese suffers if you just take it out of a vacuum seal and then put it immediately in a plastic wrap, you're doing it a disservice because that cheese, if it's younger cheese or something, could then start to change and get a little bit uh, sour. It can go bad, it needs to breathe. You know, every cheese needs to breathe. So let it breathe for a bit, go do something else, come back to it, then cut it and wrap it. Um, you'll have a happier cheese for it. Co it so. Hey, a couple questions coming at you. Are any of uh, your other cheeses made in smaller wheels like drunk, drunken goat? Um, we have a cheese called Doña Julia, which we started about a year ago. It is a very, a 15 day age goat cheese. Um, about the same size as drunken goat. So it's just a young, as close to fresh cheese as we can get. That one, small wheel, mm -hmm. uh, small whole wheels. Mm, the ones from Cantabria, we don't do anymore. We have a morro, which is not quite that small, but it's about 14, 15 ounces. That's the Portuguese cow's milk cheese from the island of Fayal. Mm -hmm. um, we have only on pre-order more a month ago, those cheeses called Estrella Artisanal. We have Alva goat cheese from Portugal, but that's two pounds, not a 14, not a, something as small as Drunken Goat Mini. The people who make the mini Drunken Goat can do a um, goat cheese um, that size. They can also do a paprika cheese that size, but it would be on a, a special order. And if there's something in particular you're thinking about, you can always let me know in a private mail. I'll continue to think about this. Nocetto is like a, 15 ounces, 14, 15 ounces soft ripened goat's milk cheese from Italy. Um, we have Malgaiola, which is um, mixed milk, wash um from, from Northern Italy. And then the Robiola di Bosco, which is about a 14 ounce wash rind um, aged Robiola that we have is also small. Those are the things that come to mind right now. That's not like a pre-cut wedge. Hey, Michelle, what, what is the age of the Pantaleo and the Alicio that we tried? Alicio's is um, 90 days and Pantaleo is um, over 100 days. Okay. Thank you. Those were good questions. Um, okay. On the Mitte Casardo, um, we can go to the next slide. Sheep! So look at how the difference in the terrain is here. So we don't have like all the rockiness there besides you know what's here in, in, the, um, in the fences. Otherwise you have some green, you have some nice pasture lands. Um, there's another picture of another cheese coming up which is still a different terrain. Um, I went in the spring so you can see all the babies there. It was super cute. Okay, hello. And this is the pecora sarda. So different from the sheep that we're gonna see coming up there. The pecora sarda produces a lot of milk, but it has slightly less butter fat than uh, some of the sheep in, in Italy. Hi, some more sheep for you, not shorn. Uh, also a little bit different terrain, uh, coming up with more high grasses, a bit more of um, the hills in the backside. So you really have a varied um, 
terrain and terroir in different microclimates in, in Sardinia. Let's see what's coming up next. There's the mago. This is the cheesemaker. This is Erenio. He's holding one of the typical um, molds that you used to be able to, that was so characteristic of Sardinia. That is um, wicker. And you used to get some like purple and orange veining like in our Crotonese and in the Bianco Sardo. You're not supposed to use it anymore and I miss it. But look how beautiful the rinds are. Over on the right, we have the Bianco Sardo in the back. There's some uh, DOP Fiori Sardo. There's some Papato. Um, so we did a really nice tasting one of the times I went. Ciao, Enenio. He says hi to you all. He said to say hi. Um, next slide, please. Just some more close up pictures of the wheels aging. Next wheel. <laughs> so this pairing we're going to do with nuts. So you all must know how nuts I am about Marconas because um, we've been talking about them for years. And it's true that for years, all I did was have Marconas that were peeled, fried and salted until I tried Marconas leaving their skins on and then fried. And now I've never stopped loving the skinless ones, but I just adore these. And I love mixing the two. I like on, on cheese boards, I put some and some for the colors, but also for the textures because the skin gives it a different texture. It gives it more tannins. And I wanted to do something with olive oil and that skin allows us to fry it in the olive oil and for the flavor profile not to be overpowering. So you have that great texture, that great flavor. This is a little bit drier than the ones that we do in the tubs. And in the tubs, for those of you who get frustrated with the oil, we can't control it because the almond itself kind of uh, absorbs oil. So when you add the oil drops, you never quite know how much is going to remain or not. And if we don't keep the oil in the buckets, then over time, the salt falls off and they taste bald and they taste old. So we try and say to you, turn the bucket upside down. So keep it one way and then turn it the other way so that you're continually letting the oil coat the almonds and keep them fresh and keep that salt flavor on there. Because I just learned that from going and buying up so many retail packages over the years before I started and they just all tasted like sawdust. And I just never wanted something so amazing to taste like sawdust. So um, we finally developed some of these retail bags. We have bags of some flavors and mini tubs of others. And in here, it keeps it fresh. It has a foil inside. And then there's, there's less oil, but this still it's a very important ingredient. And if you haven't tried the Marcano with skins, you know, please, they're amazing. Here we have some uh, Marcano trees flowering. And today our um, Portuguese almond producer just sent me the almond trees flowering there, the Dodo almonds. And it's such a beautiful sight. Like it takes my breath away whenever I see them. There isn't a specific place for the Marcona necessarily. It's all up and down the East Coast and South. You can have it in Totana and Cartagena, in Valencia and Alicante and Catalonia. Um, you have so many different areas, but more on the East. But quite frankly, where my Carm olive oil producer is, he has Marconas on his property. They were cutting them down. To, be, to plant more olive trees. I said, you can't do that. Don't do mm. that. Um, Cause they didn't know the value. I said, you have to keep those. They're so special. But um, anyway. Hey, yes. hey Michelle, do, do, do Marconas last longer with the skins on? And what is the life with the skins on versus without? And, and I don't want to actually take too much time on this because we have other cheeses to get to. So I didn't want to. Yeah, let's, I don't, I'd have to look it up. I don't, I don't have that off the top of my hand. And I think it's pretty much, I have to look, honestly. I don't know if they're given the same one. So whoever wants to know that we can follow up later. Okay. Um, I didn't do it for longevity. I did it for texture, flavor profile and different things, you know, and for having a different viewpoint. And if we can sell more than one variety of an almond we love, then that gives us more skews and more opportunity to earn more money. So to have people and if people want to, instead of going to something totally, you know, something else, and if we can sell a Marcona, why not? And let's move to it. But I will tell you all, the Marcona is in danger. There's not enough of them. Growers are stopping planting them because it flowers in February. And oftentimes if it flowers in February and then there's a frost, 
they lose part of the crop and they can't make their money. So this is a real danger. We fight every day. We have great contacts and we finally over after years have been able to, to, to sign contracts to keep our, our supply, but it is a fight and there's gonna be less and less every year. Um, but we will keep, do our best to keep our supply available because we only get the top. And the other thing to know about our almonds is you can get, if you don't know, when you buy Marconas in Spain, the people who sell it to you, they will give you up to eight to 10% of an inferior quality almond there. But because of the people I work with, and I know that I have social specs and you will have 3% or less of another almond. There's nobody who will give you 100% Marcona variety. But when you look at ours and everything else in there, we have the most percentage of actual Marconas in, in our um, packaging. Okay, let's move on. I have no idea what, where we are in time, so. Everyone, uh, I love Ms. this cheese. Yeah, tell Michelle, me. we have about 20 minutes left, left so I, I definitely want to get through some of these amazing cheeses. Um, okay, I think we're good. Um, all right, but I'm so excited to share this cheese with you. I've been talking about it for about a year and a half. It took me at least a year and a half to convince the producer to sell to me. Um, I saw him at Bra, I tasted it, you know, raw sheep's milk cheese, thistle flour from Sardinia. It's organic there, it's not NOP, but it's organic there. Um, two brothers, Gianfranco, and forgive me, I don't remember his brother's name, but I remember his wife, Anna. And the floral flavor that, the, it's just so beautiful, again harmonious, great sheep flavors, not salty, with the flour from there, the gorgeous natural rind. Um, this is actually, it's farmstead. So they have their land, they grow three types of thistle. It was the first and only time I've ever seen all three thistles live together. Um, they have their own sheep, they have their small little cheese plant on site and they have it all. Um, and it's just really terrific cheese. But he was scared to work with the States as so many people are. So I went to Bra, talked to him, told him I wanted the cheese, wrote him, called him. He really never answered me. I had to wait actually two years later. I saw him at Bra again. Once I talked to him again, told him when he said, well, God, it's two years later and she's still telling me she wants the cheese. So I guess she means business. So I finally got him to sell. <laughs> it was really, really difficult. Um, Anyway, I hope that you're loving this cheese. It is not an inexpensive cheese, but it's from an island. It's raw milk. It's like six months out of the year the sheep produce from Sardinia. We either get it six months or one year old. There's like no in between. It's made with thistle flour. It's handmade. Um, so this is, is what it is. But um, we'll always stand behind our products, help you uh, in any way, you know, to give you educational materials or do a, a call into your customers with you when we can go back to sampling. We always love to help out with sampling. We want to make ourselves available any way that we can to work as a partnership to help you sell all of these gorgeous products. Let's see about the next slide. So as opposed to being Southwest, he's right up in here in the area of Nuoro. Um, it's a uh, flatter land. There's more, he lets a lot of it be wild with the thistle and the tall grass. Um, but he is, he's right up in the center here. And uh, let's go to the next slide. Here's some of the thistle used for the cheese. Um, again, you can see the cheese better here without the, the label, the natural rind. Um, let's go, I think we get to see John Franco next. Uh, we get to see a sheep first. So this is the land here slightly different. Look at all these thistle growing high, very flat. And um, I even caught some birds back there if you can see them. Um, the next slide must be Gianfranco. There he is, Gianfranco and Anna at the show. It's like from one year to the next, it, it feels really good to finally like break through, especially since I went all the way to visit him. And then people actually open up. There's a lot of people I want their cheese and they're like, first you come to me and then we'll talk. And I have wanted a couple of things this past year and it's been very frustrating because obviously for the pandemic, I couldn't get there. I was close, but I couldn't make it there. Um, so yeah, I feel really fortunate to work with um, 
with John Franco, and I hope that together we can help build some of his cheeses and uh, and that you're enjoying it because um, it's truly a spectacular cheese for me. And thank you. Yes, I agree. It is amazing. Thank you for giving the feedback. Um, can we see? Let's check out the next slide. Here we get to see some pouring the curd and some aging of some of his cheeses. This is actually, he, make, he makes DOP Fiori Sardo. I haven't bought it yet. Um, so everything he does is on wood and then they clean the wood down. Next slide. And here we are pairing it with the Cori Hunter honey yet again, which again, for being such a delicate floral cheese, I thought it was the best pairing for today or of course the Marconas would go as well. Um, and the fig cake. So all three of those would go perfectly. The pink grapefruit mustard for me would be well too overpowering for, for the cheese. Um, any questions on any of those before we go off to Fulvi? Because I have to leave enough time to talk about this cheese for us. It is our alma mater. It is the most important one to us. It represents our the reason that we're still here, and like my partner says, that he's not on the beach in Italy somewhere, because he had this vision of that this cheese belonged in the best shops and restaurants in the US, that his future wasn't the future of the Italian industry, but in specialty foods where people appreciated flavor, history, story, and family. And that was his dream that he infused in me and that got me hooked on, on, on doing cheese. I mean, I worked in sports. I was not you know, looking to do a cheese career, but when I moved back from Europe to be with Pierluigi, all I could hear about was you know, his frustration with his importers that nobody was doing it right, that they were selling this wonderful Pecorino Romano as if it were the same as any other Pecorino Romano. And he's like, that's not the way. So I'm not one to listen to complaining for a long time. And I had just said, okay, listen, you just need to open your own company and teach me cheese and I'll like figure it out and help you do it. So this is full V Pecorino Romano. It is Pecorino from Lazio. It is, if you see on the top that orange, that's a special seal designation for Pecorino from Lazio. But the reality is, whereas years ago, Pecorino Romano started in the countryside of Rome and all producers were in the countryside of Rome until the 50s when the president of the Republic of Italy was Sardinian. Today, besides one other producer that I know of, we're pretty much it. Everybody else has been forced out of business, which is really, really sad. It costs a lot more money to produce cheese in Rome. We're not co-ops like they are in Sardinia. Our sheep produce less milk. So um, it's higher in fat and protein, use less. Fully the way the concept of the family and Pepe the partner is a 10 month to one year age Pecorino Romano, not five months. I mean, when I started in 93 and talked about Pecorino Romano, the DOP said it had to be aged minimum eight months. And then a year and a half later or some years later, they reduced it to six months because people wanted to sell more often. Fully is 10 months to one year. That's almost double. Um, another thing that makes Fulvi different is it's the size wheels. It's a 65 pound wheel. Let's go see some of the photos that we have for you and I'll keep telling you about the differences. Um, it's a great moment for me to talk to you about Fulvi because the Pecorino Romano industry is kind of going nuts right now. Uh, the year before last, the milk prices were really low. The farmers, when the milk prices are low, they decide to produce way less cheese because they don't like the prices that low. So there was less cheese production and then the pandemic. So right now there's a shortage of cheese and the prices have just gone up almost three euros a kilo. Fully because, you know, our sheep's milk costs more. We had more labor. We were smaller there. There was always a difference of at least one, $1.50 a pound, $2.50 a pound difference in the Roman cheeses from the Sardinian cheeses because of size and, um, production and the cost of the milk. The milk always costs more. Now it's a great moment to want to really get behind Fulvi because the pricing is more equal. But for us, I won't say better, it's different cheese. It's not as hard. It's not as dry. 
It's not as salty. They've even reduced the salt process, even though I'll show you how that's done. It's a different cheese. So I invite you to play with it, play with your food. Look at the color. It's much yellower. It's not white like your paper. Mm -hmm. Break it off, press it. You feel it softer. It's not as hard and dry. It doesn't get, when you eat it, it doesn't get stuck here. It goes down, it slides. If you shred it or shave it, it has all of these textures, great texture. If you grate it, it doesn't disappear in food. And human nature says, I wanna see what I eat. So they're gonna keep grating. So even if it costs more than certain other Pecorino Hermanos, it's a better value because you need less cheese. But for who you are, for me, like having a family story. I mean, Uncle Mimo, he died like six years ago, which is really sad. Um, but this is a family company that went to another family. The Sini company bought it from the Fulvi family who has been producing for a really long time, over 60 years um, with the very best milk in the very best way. We're gonna see the hand salting. Um, there's a story and a history behind it. And the best test is to taste them side by side. And you can see the difference as well. I, I invite you to. It's something that I like to sit and just eat with a glass of wine. It's what I want to use. Well, Pecorino Romano, I always say to use with the Caesar salad because um, you have a salad with a lot of flavor and you need a cheese that stands up to it. So you use less. Mm -hmm. If you have a saltiness of all those anchovy and the mustard and use Parmigiano, you're just wasting your time because you have to put double or triple of cheese. Um, can we go on to the next slide, please? Lazio, countryside of Rome. It used to be that you could make the cheese in R in Rome, LA Latina, um, R I Riete, and VT Viterbo. We're VT8, Viterbo 8, one hour north of Rome. Come visit us. We would love to show you our place, but we'll show you a little bit here. So, um, next slide, please. There we go. There are my sheep. Soprevisana and Siciliana. Every day there are less Soprevisana sheep, but they still use Soprevisana and the Sicilian sheep, which have higher butter fat and lower yield. So that's, um, plus there are less smaller herds and less sheep, and they end up the milk costs more than it does in, in Sardinia to make the, the cheese. Next slide, please. Hi guys, this is a video, right? Don't the, the, yeah, here we go. It was really hard to get close to these sheep. They're very, they're really scaredy cats. <laughs> <laughs> that's the countryside of Rome. I have to tell you that, whoops, that's no longer the countryside of Rome. This is Pepe and he's got a great sense of humor. So whenever I go, he has to put some sort of a helmet on me or I wore a Napoleon's cap when we did the, uh, the, um, the trial here. Um, he has our hat. There's Buona Tabla, which has been the name of the company for a long time. And he's so much fun to work with. And he's been wonderful. He totally redid everything and all the caves and worked with us to get his IFS. And he's doing fixed weight seven out wedges now, which is something that we were never able to do before. So he's worked very hard. Um, the Grand Cacho is a six month age sheep's milk cheese that he does with like the, once you crush all the olives and you have like that heart paste around it, he uses that around the rind, which is another really cool cheese. So thank you, Pepe. Next slide, please. This is the curd, the wonderful, beautiful curd. And here, that machine, no, it's okay. Go to the other one, forward. So here, the cheese has just come out, poured and it's been pressed. And this machine actually cuts the curd. And then the guys are gonna put it in these molds. After a little while, they're gonna slip inside the mold, this uh, a blue mold with that has all the dots, the pin dots, which is one of the um, requirements for being Pecorino Romano duck plus the sheep's head. Now this is a hundred pounds of curd that goes in here and it's really hard and slippery. It looks easy because they're used to it, but I'll tell you, I tried to do this thing and it was um, super interesting. So they're gonna leave it here for a while and then they're gonna put it in a, um, a warm room so that it's gonna help separate the curds from the way a little bit more. At the time when they put 
the pin drops in there and then the sheep's head, they'll also have a plaque which they give, they put a, well, they put a casein plaque for tracing each wheel. And then they put our number, VT Viterbo 8. There was this whole time where all the Italians would say, oh, that's not really the real Romano in Rome. You know, you guys are just making it up and painting it black. Um, in the countryside of Rome, they used to protect their cheeses by covering it with mud. And that's where the black rind came from. And then in my industry where I worked, there was a bunch of, um, people in Sardinia who said, oh, in Rome, they get more money. Let's just make a little bit bigger wheel and we'll cover it in black and we'll send it to the Americans and they won't know the difference. So people would challenge that our cheese was truly from the area, but it is for sure. But the proof is in the flavor, is just in the flavor. I'll show you some of our aging rooms and how we salt. Oh, okay. So here is, in our natural caves underground, it's all natural and um, you have some ventilation, but the coolness is, it's um, not like, um, just like this big refrigerator. Now he, they're taking humid salt and rubbing it on each wheel. And I used to make like jokes about how well, they're not listening to any music or anything. They're just sitting there wheel by wheel by wheel by wheel. They add the salt by hand every week, then every two weeks, then every three weeks up until three months so that the salt seeps in gradually. If, it if you add too much on the outside, you block it so you have more rind and less cheese. If you look at your wedge of cheese, if you have the outer part, try and find the rind. There's not very much because if it's rind, you have to grate it. So the less rind you have, the more edible the rest of the cheese is. If you add it gradually, it will seep in little by little so that your cheese has flavor on the outside and all the way in and it won't be bland inside. The salting process is very important and so many producers in Sardinia don't hand salt, but they brine the cheese. So this is one of our secrets that we have here. Um, next, uh, next. I don't know if there was a video on there, but here are some of the aging rooms, obviously overflowing a little bit here. Um, the cheese, they um, vacuum seal the cheese at a certain time and they slow age some of it so that it doesn't get stained with mold. Um, these are still ones here that are waiting to be turned and flipped. Um, but it's all really just a beautiful facility underneath. Uh, let's see what's next. Um, just wanna, just wanna um, beep in here for a second too, just to say if anybody has any questions, uh, this would be a good time to, to post them because we are getting to the end of the hour. So I know that Michelle will be happy to answer questions offline but please feel free to, to throw them out there right now. It looks like I have three minutes as well. So I'll just tell you about, this is Paolo's Pink Grapefruit Mostarda. It is candied fruit, local fruit that has been, uh, yeah, she candies the fruit and then she adds a spicy mustard extract. The mustard extract is a hazmat. Um, so a lot of chefs would just try and buy for me this, um, the mustard extract to make their own mostarda. Um, but it is, it has to be, you have to sell it in seared drums, in sealed drums. There's some sort of a chemical reaction that happens with the mustard when you add sugar that makes it become edible so that you can use it. And um, hopefully you like our new packaging. The whole line has new packaging like this too. Um, just fun and playful. And this stands up beautifully to the Fulvio Romano to any sort of a full flavored cheese. It's great with charcuterie. It's great with grilled meats. And it's just such a fun, fun thing. We know that mustardas aren't necessarily an easy sell, but if you're excited about it, we'll figure out a way with you to help, you know, educate people more. But it's, it's just such a fun pairing um, and a wonderful product for, for cheese. Look at Paula. She's a really talented lady. And I've tasted lots of different mustarda there. And I always love the balance of her fruit and the spiciness, but it's not just all spiciness. For those of you who aren't sure, the Mantovana Mostarda is always about sliced cut fruit and the Cremona, the mustard from Cremona or the whole fruits. Um, so I just wanna take this time to thank you all for all your time, for what you do in the industry. Um, we couldn't do it without you. Uh, this is our passion, you know, you are our lifeline and we can't do it ourselves. We can't do it without our, our producers and we can't do it without you. And um, I look forward to the time that we can see you again at shows where I can travel and come see people. And um, 
I just really appreciate the opportunity to be here today to be able to share with you. And I'm hoping that all your packages arrived in wonderful condition and that you've been able to enjoy this tasting. And I can't wait to hear back from you on what your favorites were. And I'm curious about um, some of the trivia that Chelsea did out there. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. This was has been, as promised, an amazing class. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you for having me. And uh, thank you all for listening. I was trying to say you're welcome to everyone. <laughs> <laughs>